people listen for it, and they know it's there. So we don't even know what we're doing. So that's what this Manichaean devil does. And an interesting little sideline about Vietnam. <clears throat> the Vietnam escalation modestly began in the Kennedy era. And Kennedy was said to have around him the Irish Mafia. If you know much about the lore of old Ireland, you'll know that the Irish mother would tell her bothersome child, if you aren't a good boy, the Kong will get you. The Kong will get you. The Kong was a ghost in the closet, see? Well, in Vietnam, uh, the word for a beggar is a Ka, K-H-A. And they were briefing about these beggars, these troublemakers in Vietnam, and they were calling them the Viet Cong. Well, Kennedy's young Irish Mafia men who did not know much about Vietnam thought they were talking about the Viet Cong, the devil in a closet. And the word Viet Cong was created by mistake, by, by hearing the word Ka as a Vietnam, Vietnamese word and Cong as the Irish ghost. And it just happened that in that era, we all of a sudden got Viet Cong out of the misapplication of the word right in an office in, in, in the, the Pentagon of Washington and not out in the field. And ever after that, it was the Viet Cong. Well, that's how we create our Manichaean devils. That's how we create our opposition. That's how we spend six trillion dollars. Uh, you write further on uh, concerning the realization of the Dulles Jackson Korea's reports method of placing CIA agents throughout the government. Quote, many of these people who have reached positions of great responsibility I believe that the most powerful and certainly the most useful agent the CIA has ever had operates in just such a capacity within another branch of the government, and he has been there for so long that few have any idea that he is a long-term career agent of the CIA. Through his most excellent and skillful services, more CIA operations have been enabled to take place than can be laid at the feet of the agency, at the feet of any other more legitimate agent. This was the plan and the wisdom of the Dulles idea from the beginning. On the basis of security, he would place people in all areas of the government, and then he would move them up and deeper into their cover jobs until they began to take a very active part in the role of their own organizations. This is how the ST was born, the secret team. Today, the role of the CIA is performed by an ad hoc organization that is much greater in size, strength, and resources than the CIA has ever been visualized to be. So th the first question I have here would be, how, quote, on the basis of security, unquote, would Alan Dulles, quote, place people in all other areas of the government? Well, one of the first things that I realized was that it was Mr. Dulles' desire to have the office that General White asked me to create uh, in the Air Force headquarters in order to create a focal point system. And uh, as Mr. Dulles told me later, he said, I don't want various people from my agency going into the Pentagon and dealing with different people there and therefore uncovering the activities of the CIA to a large number of people because obviously such a ring would then proliferate to others <clears throat> and if they wanted submarines they'd have to bring in some Navy people and if they wanted uh, helicopters they'd have to talk to some Army people. He said, I want a focal point. I want an office that's cleared to do what, what we have to have done, uh, an office that knows us very, very well and then an office ha has access to a si system in the Pentagon but the system will not be aware of what initiated the request. They'll think it came from the Secretary of Defense. They won't realize it came from the Director of Central Intelligence. So you see, the Dulles philosophy was to control the focal point area. This led then to the creation of focal point offices everywhere. And yeah. as I established this uh, Tab 6 organization, we called it, in every major staff area within the, the Air Force, because that was my jurisdiction at the time, I would have cleared people, another focal point, or you might say a, a sub-focal point, a person I could go to who had been given ahead of time the authority to do whatever it was 
that he was authorized to do. And, uh, and, and we stressed that authorized business. He would have to be sure he had orders either from my office or directly up to the chief of staff and that we knew what we were doing for CIA. Well, this leads to another step you might call breeding. We had to work with uh, various agencies of the government, not just the Defense Department. We had to have contact points in, uh, in the State Department, in the FAA, in the Customs Service, in the Treasury, in the FBI, and all around through the government, up in the White House. And gradually, we, we wove a network of people who understood the symbols and the code names and the things we were doing and how we handled money, which was the most important thing. And then we began to assign people there who those agencies thought were from the Defense Department, but they actually were people that we put there from the CIA. Mm -hmm. This led to the, to the creation of a system of powerful individuals, people whose jobs were quite dominant in some of these other agencies, especially after they'd been there two or three years, because we, we put them in there by talking to the top man, the, the cabinet officer or the, the head of the agency, and we'd say, this man is being placed here so that he can facilitate uh, covert activities and so that he can retain the secrecy that's required, and he will keep you informed at all times. Well, in the bureaucracy, the top people move faster than anybody else, not the bottom people. And so the man we had explained that to maybe a year and a half earlier would be transferred or leave the government. But our man is still there. So one or two cycles of that, and that agency might not even know that guy was, was there anymore. He, they would, and I mean, what his origins were, they would think he was just another one of their own employees. And as a result, he became extremely effective because if we wanted something done, I remember a, a rather very, very sensitive operation that I needed some information on, and I needed it from the FBI. I didn't go to the FBI. I went to this guy that we had planted, and he got it twice as fast and, and um, in a much better form than I would have gotten from the, from the FBI. Even though I was at that time working from the Office of Secretary of Defense, we had no trouble working with the FBI, was just to facilitate it. Yeah. These people became very, very adept. By the so same token, people that were employees of CIA agents were assigned even in the Office of, of the Secretary of Defense. We had certain people there who were CIA employees. Ed Lansdale worked for CIA all his, all his uh, adult career. A person named Frank Hand worked there. Now, the people in the Pentagon thought they were ordinary military employees. They, they didn't realize. Uh, well, just to give you an example, uh, Colonel Lansdale uh, was a full colonel in the Air Force. That was his cover story. And he had been a full colonel for a few years. And uh, the Air Force was promoting some men to general. The question came up, was, would Lansdale be eligible? Huh. And uh, I told Mr. Dulles personally, I said, you know, you can make Lansdale a general if you just write a letter to uh, General LeMay because you're going to pay the bills anyway and uh, not the Air Force. A few days later, I got a call from General May's office. He called me in and he had the list of men that the Air Force was promoting to general. And as I recall, it was only 13 or 14 officers and LeMay, uh, being General LeMay, knew every one of them in him except one. They said, I don't know who the hell he is. I'm not going to promote him to a general. And I said, well, don't you have a file on him? He said, yes. He opened it up and the top letter was from Alan Dulles. I said, he's a very important man for Alan Dulles. It's okay. I'll promote him. Just like that. Well, that's a good way to get a promotion, you see. But that created a very important job within the structure of the Office of Secretary of Defense. Uh, Frank Hand had been there for years in the same way. Frank was a, a civilian of, uh, I always wrote, that he was the most important agent that the agency had because he was operating daily and effectively as a member of the Office of Secretary of Defense. And you can think of the things that a person in that capacity can do when his home base really is CIA. Well. Uh, although people didn't believe this when they first heard it, there are assignments like that in the White House. There are assignments like that in the State Department. It's hard to tell the difference, you might say, between Bill Bundy, who was a longtime CIA employee, and McGeorge Bundy, who was in the White House with Kennedy. The two brothers certainly want to act side by side. They have the same goals and the same intentions. Well, there were many things that duplicated like that. So that it wasn't long before, and I'd say by the end of the 50s, early 60s, 
before we had spread through the government uh, what I called a secret team, a group of people who really knew how to operate the CIA business. Now, uh, this business of the inner team of workers, uh, all actually operating within the law. There was uh, once in a while some aberration, but we usually found it and brought it to uh, Mr. Dulles' attention. But generally working within the law could get rather phenomenal things done. For example, one day I got a call from the agency. They had heard of the capability of a new aircraft that had been designed at MIT and they wanted to know if the Air Force had an interest in it. Well, the Air Force hardly knew about it. I had seen a picture of it in the newspaper. And uh, I said, well, let me find out what we can do about that. I called the company, a small company, but it had uh, very preeminent people, uh, Dr. Coppin from MIT and Dr. Bollinger from Harvard Business School and a lot of very good aircraft uh, designers and builders in the company. So the company was solidly on the ground, but it was a very small company. And I told the man that I was talking to that I was from the Air Force, I was colonel in the Air Force, and that we had an interest in this small plane for certain special activities, and that I would send a representative of my office up there to talk with them. Well, I called in a CIA man, the same man that had called me, and I said, look, you're from my office, here's some credentials, you go up there, you see this company, you know what you want. And I didn't know whether they'd really want the plane or not, but they decided they did. In fact, they wanted hundreds of them, something that company had never heard of before, orders in that number. And sure enough, we bought hundreds of those airplanes for the CIA, technically for the Air Force. The Air Force had no concern with this because the CIA money paid for it, didn't cost us anything. But we didn't go through the Air Force procurement procedures at all. We, we just completely went just like a civilian, buying airplanes. And uh, the CIA was delighted with the plane. They used them, they used so many of them in, in the Southeast Asia that there was a flyer's handbook with what were called helio strips. In other words, air landing grounds that only the helio airplane could land on because it could land a very short uh, and it was under control right down to the ground. So these these little runways were hardly suitable for heli helicopters and this little helio plane was operating regularly. And uh, well, millions and millions of dollars were poured into that exercise. A lot of people were involved in it and it never went through any Air Force procurement. Huh. Now. The cleared individual, the man and the team, in the procurement offices made papers that covered up this gap. There were papers in the files, but they had never been worked on. They were simply dummy papers in the files. Now, we could do things like that with no trouble at all. The U-2 was started like that. That's how the U-2 got off the ground, ostensibly purchased by the Air Force, but not paid for by the Air Force, and so on. So when I say that this team was quite effective, it was... Uh, very effective, very strong, handled a lot of money, worked all over the world, thousands of people were involved. And um, I know one time when I was speaking to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, at that time General Lemnitzer, he asked, he said, you know, I've known of two or three units in the Army that were supporting CIA. He said, but you're talking about quite a few. He said, how many were there? Well, at that time there were 608. Well, General Lemnitzer had no idea of it. And it's, it's amazing. Here's the top man in the military and he had no idea that we were supporting that many CIA units. Not military units, they were phony military units. They were operating with military people, but they were controlled entirely. They were financed by the CIA, 608 of them. And I'm sure that from my day it increased. I know it didn't decrease. So people don't understand the size and the nature of this clandestine activity that is designed for clandestine operations all over the world. And it goes back again to things we've spoken of earlier, that that activity must be under somebody's control. There is no law for the control of covert operations other than at the National Security Council level. And if the National Security Council does not sign the directives, issue the directives for covert operations, then nobody does. And that's when it becomes a shambles as we saw in the Contra affair and in other things. But the National Security Council steps in and directs it and holds that control, then things are run properly. And, and we've seen that uh, during the last decade there's been quite a few aberrations, whether we're talking about Iran or Latin America or even a, 
uh, part of the Vietnam War itself. In fact, it was in the Vietnam War where the thing really began to come apart. It just outgrew itself and the leadership role uh, disintegrated. And we see the worst of it in the Iran-Contra affair. Uh, sort of following on that, you, you write about them, uh, Dulles being able to move them up and deeper into their covered jobs. Would this be a function of them being there longer than the people who would be promoted to something else in yes. time? When we put them in, they might be somebody's assistant. And they've been there for three years, and the man that was above them, who was probably a political appointee, leaves. And uh, they might move this man up there. Or when a new political appointee comes, he has no knowledge that this man is really from CIA. He's just a strong person in his office, and he gives him a broader role. Sometimes these people <laughs> were working. Uh, one man I know was in FAA, and we needed his work uh, to help us with FAA as a focal point there. He had been there so long, the FAA had him in a very big, very responsible job, and, and uh, you might say 90% of his work was regular FAA work, a very, very strong individual. Well, that meant that when we needed him to help us with some of our, our activities on the covert side of things, he was in a much better position to handle this than he had been originally. This happened with quite a few, and that's why I say in the case of Frank Hand, he had been in the Defense Department so long that he, he was able to handle uh, really major operations that uh, weren't even visualized at the time he was assigned. And, and uh, oh, this carries over into, into many other things. You know, I pointed out that the Office of Special Operations under General Erskine uh, had the responsibility for the National Security Agency as well as CIA contacts and the State Department and so on. Well, as we filled up these positions, uh, some of them became dominant in some of those organizations, such as NSA. Uh, early people in this program uh, have, have uh, created quite a career for themselves in other work. For instance, a young man in this system was Major Haig, Major Al Haig. He went up through the system. He was, re he was working as a deputy to the Army's cleared focal point officer for agency support matters, who was um, the general counsel of the Army, a man named Joe Califano, a very prominent lawyer today. When, uh, when the general counsel of the Army was moved up into the Office of Secretary of Defense later in McNamara's office, he uh, carried with him this uh, then Lieutenant Colonel Al Haig up to the Office of Secretary of Defense and during the Johnson administration when they moved to the White House uh, Califano and Haig moved to the White House then during the Nixon time Haig with the law of his experience in the White House worked with Kissinger and you can see that it was this uh, attachment through the covert side which gave Haig his his ability to do an awful lot of things that people didn't understand because he had this whole team behind him. Yeah. Well, uh, to be even more up to date, uh, there was a major C chord in our system, and major C chord is the same general C chord you've been reading about in the Iran Contra business. A lot of these people uh, worked right up into the White House, and there there were these same assigned people even at the White House level that really were uh, working on this CIA covert work rather than the jobs that they seemed to hold. Uh, that the public understood it was a job that had been a, that they were working for. It's a much more effective system people have thought it was. Uh, the last sentence you said, today the role of the CIA is performed by an ad hoc organization that is much greater in size, strength, and resources than the CIA has ever been visualized to be. You alluded to this before. What is your sense of what this ad hoc organization, organization encompasses today? Well, you see, we've, we've said this quite a few times, that there is no law, there is no structure for covert operations. The government didn't confront that in 1947 when they wrote the law. Right. There has been no rev revision of the law to accommodate that. There have been decisions by the National Security Council which do assign covert operations, primarily to CIA, but on a time-to-time -time basis. In fact, one of the strongest of these papers, uh, if I remember the designation, was NSC 10 Slant 2, uh, was in my files early in the business back in uh, 1955. And I remember that on the side of the paper, written in pencil and in his own hand, President Eisenhower had written that any time a decision had been made 
for the Defense Department to support the agency with arms, equipment, money, people, bases, etc., that the equipment was to be limited to that one time only and withdrawn. He did not want the CIA to create a capability that was ongoing, as he was very specific about it. Well, that was 1955. Those things changed with the times, and they got more powerful and more powerful. And because of that kind of growth, you don't have the legal structure. You don't have the approved structure. It's an ad hoc creation, yeah. uh, probably the strongest ad hoc creation in our government today. Wow. Uh, again, focusing on this Dulles Jackson career report, you write, the CIA has the authority, or at least it is given the authority by other government agencies to create cover organizations within other parts of the government. This is one of the key tasks that the old Dulles Jackson career report set out to accomplish. And a couple of questions that I really have about this is, one is, wh how is it that other government agencies give the CIA the authority to create CIA cover organizations within themselves? It's more simple than you visualize. Um, what we do, after all, all of the government is willing to cooperate with and work with other parts of the government at any time. If sure. it was the Department of Agriculture, we'd never have any trouble working with them and so on. So we understand that. That's a given in the beginning. Okay. But what we would do is we would have a, a top-level meeting, either with uh, Alan Dulles or somebody like uh, Dick Helms or Frank Wisner or one of those people, would pay a call directly on the head of this department. And since I've mentioned it before, I'll say the FAA. So you would go to the federal administrator for the Federal Aviation Administration, and we'd, we'd say, look, it's necessary from time to time that the CIA has to operate aircraft, perhaps a little differently than your regulations specify because we're doing a clandestine operation. Or perhaps our aircraft, we have to have two aircraft with the same number on them at the same time. So if that ever turns up on one of your control towers that that an airplane lands this morning and its, its tail number is 1234, another plane comes in this afternoon of the same type and its tail number is 1234, uh, don't do anything about it. Just it's a covert operation that we're operating, and they would agree to it. They say fine. Then Mr. Dulles would say, "I'd like to assign a person to your administration as a focal point officer, so that anything comes up like this, the anybody in the FA will contact that man, or vice versa. He'll contact them ahead of time to say we're running this kind of a covert mission, and your people will know about it." We never ran into a problem with that. And if the workload was heavy, we'd augment that man. He'd have two people, three people. Or if there was something that was going to last for three months or six months, we might put ten people there. And when we went to take the ten people back, we might take five back and leave the five there. So that over a period of years, what had started as just a simple focal point office became a very large one. Mm -hmm. When I created Team B in the Air Force as a fo focal point office, uh, I had one assistant and one secretary. In short order, I had uh, several thousand people around the world. Wow. Things just grow by the job. By the nature of the work. Yeah. Uh, this is tied in with all the rest, as, of course, discussions of the CIA would be, uh, concerning the fact that the National Security Act of 1947 was quite strict with reference to money for the CIA. Discuss the impact of the CIA Act of 1949 which made it possible for the agency to have no trouble at all getting adequate funds. I think without any question, the secret of covert operation is the control of money. And uh, that begins with having a, an account, uh, a good-sized account, and the means to use it throughout the government. By 1949, the CIA was able to convince Congress that many of the things they were doing were perfectly legitimate, and that many of the things they were doing cost money because they were paying for people in other government agencies. They were paying their salaries. You see, when these when these people were assigned, as I said, uh, when uh, General LeMay promoted Lansdale to be general, it didn't cost the Air Force anything. His paycheck came from CIA, and the the Air Force paycheck would be torn up. It would go to a certain office where they would destroy it, and it didn't cost the Air Force anything. In 1949, the then Secretary of Defense, a man named Lewis Johnson, 
wrote a very important paper with respect to covert operations. He said that the, that the Department of Defense would support the CIA in any of its approved covert operations uh, fully, provided that the CIA would reimburse the Department of Defense for all out-of-pocket costs. They wouldn't have to reimburse for the purchase price of an aircraft because the Air Force had that, but they would have to reimburse for the cost of operating that aircraft, for the cost of any other facilities required, even for the salaries of crews that were assigned to that aircraft over a period of time. This philosophy of reimbursement is very important in covert operations because it keeps bills from appearing in public that would stir up questions about, you know, why was this money spent when it wasn't spent uh, for the line uh, budgeted items. So when we created the TAB6 system, we worked the reimbursement system in throughout so that you never saw the, sp uh, the spending of any money. The Air Force never spent any money on the CIA operations, technically. Yeah. The money was immediately transferred through a comptroller's office arrangement up in the Office of Secretary of Defense, and that money was actually agency money. Well, within a few years, the agency was able to point out to Congress that a lot of money was flowing in that channel because effectively they were paying for very high cost equipment, aircraft, submarines, even aircraft carriers in a few places, very expensive things to operate on a reimbursable basis. So based on that, the agency began to get a much larger budget. Then when they went into the U-2 and when they went into space programs, that budget grew considerably. And since it was a completely, totally classified budget, and almost non-accountable. The, the uh, DCI has the authority to spend that money simply on his signature. He doesn't have to account for it. It's a very rare thing in budget process, but the Congress goes along with that. And as a result, because of the law of 1949, which permitted this activity, and the letter from Lewis Johnson, the policy statement that we would carry out all our work on a reimbursable basis, and other departments and agencies of the government followed that procedure. The agency uh, was allocated a considerable amount of money after 1949, and it was under their own control. Uh, could you comment on the fact then that, quoting from the book, uh, more important than the dollars the agency gets is what can be done, it, is what it can do with those dollars to make them cover all sorts of research, development, procurement, real estate ventures, stockpiles, and anything else money will buy, including tens of thousands of people who do not show on any official rosters. Yeah, one of the most interesting results of this horizontal application of money or, or reimbursement is that it can be used to pay salaries without explaining that they were for salary. They're just an expenditure of money. The, the DCI would sign it off as an expense, but it might have paid for the salaries of 100 people. Well, I don't know how familiar you are with the way government handles its people, but each department and agency has a certain stated number of people that are budgeted for because they have to be paid every year, their pensions have to be paid, some of them have insurance and other obligations of the government, so they're very carefully monitored. This is one of the few places in the government where money equal people. Mm -hmm. And if you're paying people, we'll say, $20,000 a year, and you spend $100,000 for five people, the $100,000 did not say it was for five people, whereas all the rest of the government did. And this enabled us to put people into programs that were not visible. Well, if you carry it out to other things, the same we are able to buy aircraft that were not visible. We're able to buy radars that were not visible. So that the money in this method of operation is truly uh, concealed in a budget without anybody. Congress doesn't know where it is, and I don't think they've ever made any attempt to try to find out where it is. They, they allo allocate a bulk sum and then just sit back. Well, there's no end to the things you can do with money that way. The agency during my period of operation with them, for instance, had an account with uh, the big banks in Wall Street that is like seed and core, you know, street name accounts. I don't know whether you're familiar with that finance term or not, but one of the biggest of the street name accounts is seed incorporated, C-E-D-E. -E. 
And this is where money is that's between transactions on the stock market. It's got to be somewhere, so they assign it to seed and company. Well, seed is nobody. It's just under the control of major banks, and the money's flowing. But while it flows, it has to belong to somebody, especially when it's in big numbers. Well, the CIA had and may still have a street name called Sidem, S-U-Y-D-A-M. And when money was in the Sidem account, I don't think the financiers knew it, maybe a few did, but it was CIA's money because some of the things they did, like, for example, operate Air America, in order to cover Air America's operation, they would have to do some commercial work. So they had quite an income from this huge airline, and that money would be put into the Sidem account. And... Uh, it interested me one time when I had a breakdown of the Sidem account to find out that uh, an awful lot of CIA money had been invested in a major supermarket chain in this country. <laughs> and in, in today's world, they might have been able to take over the, the operation of the supermarket. But it was just a quick place to put money that the CIA had made and would spend later um, in their own operations. And it got to be very large amounts of money at time. Well... Uh, if I were in Congress today, I think I'd take a look at that because, you see, sometimes when you hear about the money being handled for the Contras or the sale of things to Iranians and everything, you begin to realize there is an awful lot of potential for money to be handled there without being accounted for. Well, we saw that back in the days when we did account for it, um, and uh, I think people would be surprised to find out that it was uh, uh, such a large activity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this brings us to a degree with other ways of spending the money. Uh, the One of the ways that the CIA, apparently from reading your book, as far as my understanding goes, was able to develop these cover units around the world that would hold equipment that would be earmarked for its use, even though it might be labeled a military unit, was through uh, early aspects of CIA being able to involve itself in the war plans that were developed in the late 40s, early 50s that tried to combine nuclear strategies with conventional strategies. You write, as a result of the war planning role of the CIA, it was easy for the CIA planners to enter in the plans of all armed forces, requirements for wartime equipment vehicles, aircraft, and facilities that had to be earmarked and stockpiled for use by the agency in the event of war. Once such requirements were listed in the war plans, they could be requisitioned along with all other war plan material. This meant that the cost of this equipment would be worked into the military budget, and then in due time, each item would be purchased and delivered to the advanced base site where war plan material was stockpiled. Warehouse after warehouse of, quote, military equipment, unquote, is stored in the Far East, in Europe, and throughout the United States for the eventual use of the CIA. The cost of this material and of its storage, care, and conditioning is inestimable. As the years passed and as the agency's, quote, military role became more a matter of custom and generally <coughs> accepted, agency military cover units became so deeply covered that their neighboring military units did not know or forgot that the unit near them was not a regular military unit. By that time, requisitions from these CIA units were as readily acceptable as any others, and the units became easily self-supporting without any agency funding input. From this, I'd like you to please discuss this rise and growth of the logistical global network of the support side of the CIA and how the existence of this relatively unknown component of the support section is fundamental to the CIA's ability to engage in clandestine operations. You see, this grew out of the natural war planning function of the military. And uh, right after World War II and on into the early 50s, we visualized that a war would begin with some attack, we'll say, on the NATO lines, <clears throat> more or less like conventional World War II, but that it would immediately elevate to the nuclear exchange. It was planned that <coughs> in that nuclear exchange, we would try to preserve certain areas in the target country, say the Soviet Union, that would not be hit 
and judging by meteorological data would not be the uh, covered by fallout, which would be radioactive for years and years, and that in that area we would have the CIA create uh, certain network agent functions and groups of people <clears throat> that we could immediately send uh, special forces by power drop in, and this is the original special forces uh, uh, function, not the contrived one that grew on the, the Vietnam War. Well, with this in the war plan, then this becomes a matter of the basic military budget each year. And would the CIA considered a, third, a fourth force, Army, Navy, Air Force, and CIA, what the CIA needed for its war planning functions on behalf of the United States government, the total government, would then be treated as part of the military budget, not the agency's budget. Mm. Well, in the beginning, this amounted to trucks, aircraft, weapons, uh, all these things that they would have, radios and everything else, that they visualized their function would require right after the, what we used to call, post-strike function. The agency learned that this worked pretty good, and they had warehouses under their name, in the name of a of military unit, we would say, for instance, we'd create a unit, the, the uh, 234 Provisional Support Group. And uh, the 234 Provisional Support Group in Germany, staffed with all military people, of course, CIA people in military uniforms, uh, would begin to fill its warehouses. And they'd have trucks and jeeps and guns and radios and everything else, ambulances, the whole works, everything else the other rest of the military had. So the agency was quick to see that if they visualized their post-strike function as uh, bigger this year than it was last year, they'd have more things to put in the warehouse. And then, since NATO exercises are run every year to uh, train in the war plan, they would have to have more and more equipment for the NATO exercises, and they did a very good job of filling their warehouses, and then in using this equipment on, quote, exercises, which really were covert operations. So this was an area in this business of reimbursement we weren't able to keep up with. We knew it existed. We knew what they were doing. We supplied the equipment. And it was sort of an even exchange. We figured, well, we've, we've told the agency there to be the fourth force. They're going to do a job in wartime. Might as well let them use it and train themselves and everything else. So first thing we knew, the agency was able, despite President Eisenhower's uh, warning, to create quite a force. And they had a lot of aircraft of their own, they had trucks of their own, they had all this equipment. And um, this was the way that they ran their business under the war plan. Uh, I don't know what has happened to that in today's world. I assume it has grown and not been, you know, not, not gone. Uh, I have never heard anything about it since the days when I worked on it regularly. Uh, I think if anybody looked into the war planning in the Far East or in Europe, uh, they would find that this still exists under one cover or other, and that it explains the reason why the agency is able to get equipment immediately for almost any covert activity in any part of the world. Uh, just as an example, when we heard a lot about the Nicaraguan, Contra, El Salvador problems in Latin America during the last decade, uh, I noticed that the plane that went down with a man named Hassenfuss on board was a C-123. Well. That was one of these airplanes in the agency's uh, stockpile. It was not. It was an Air Force plane, but it was one used by the agency. I knew the designation. Very few people have ever heard of an airplane called a Chase, but the 122 was designed by an airplane company called Chase Aircraft. 123 was a modification of that. And uh, uh, with things like that, you can see that the agency is still operating within this same structure of the fourth force concept, and I imagine it still exists. Uh -huh. And you, you describe what seems to be a very uh, enlightening day, an event in 1960 or 61, when you briefed the chairman of the JCS, Joint Chiefs of Staff, on a matter that had come up involving the CIA and the military. As you described it, the chairman was General Lyman L. Limnitzer, and his com commandant was General David M. Shoup, they were close friends and had known each other for years. When the primary subject of the briefing had ended, General Lemnitzer asked me about the Army cover unit 
that was involved in the operation. I explained what its role was and more or less added that this was a rather routine matter. Then he said, Prouty, if this is routine, yet General Shoup and I have never heard of it before, can you tell me in round numbers how many army units there are that exist as cover for the CIA? I replied that to my knowledge at that time there were about 605 such units, some real, some mixed, and some that were simply telephone drops. When he heard that, he turned to General Shoup and said, you know, I realized that we provided cover for the agency from time to time, but I never knew that we had anywhere near so many permanent cover units and that they existed all over the world. I then asked General Lemnitzer if I might ask him a question. He said I could. General, I said, during all of my military career, I have done one thing or another at the direction of a senior officer. In all of those years and in all of those circumstances, I have always believed that someone, either at the level of the officer who told me to do what I was doing or further up the chain of command, knew why I was doing what I had been directed to do and that he knew what the reason for doing it was. Now I am speaking to the senior military officer in the armed forces, and I have just found out that some things I have been doing for years in support of the CIA have not been known, and that they have been done most likely in response to other authority. Is this correct? This started a friendly, informal, and most enlightening conversation, more or less to the effect that where the CIA was concerned, there were a lot of things no one seemed to know. Can you recount more of the details of this enlightening conversation for us? Well, you know, I referred to it earlier. That um, it, it, it astounded me that day. I, I assumed that there were a lot of things that uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was not aware of every day uh, in the Air Force, in the Navy, uh, and, and in the CIA. But I had never expected such a, a blanket answer that he didn't know that, and that uh, General Shoup didn't. Now, what we were talking about was rather specific. <clears throat> At the time of the rebellion in Indonesia, when the CIA supported tens of thousands of troops with aircraft and ships and submarines and everything else in an attempt to overthrow the government of uh, Sukarno, uh, we needed rifles pretty quick to support these rebels. And I called out to Okinawa and found that the army didn't have enough rifles for what we wanted, 42,000 rifles. They had about 30,000. But the, he said he thought he could get, so General Lemnitzer said, who, General Lemnitzer was a commander in the Ryukus command at that time, Okinawa. So he was right up close to this thing. He said that he'd have somebody call the Marine Corps and see what he could get from them. Well, it just happened that General Shoup was the head of the Marine unit at Okinawa, and he said, sure, he could provide the extra 12,000. So without delay, we had uh, four-engine aircraft, C-54s, flown by um, uh, Air America crews, uh, but under military cover, appeared to be military aircraft, come into Okinawa and pick up these 42,000 rifles prepared for airdrop in Indonesia. They'd fly down the Philippines and down to another base we had and then over into the Indonesia and drop these rifles. Well, of course, we replaced those rifles. The general didn't know where they were going. We just borrowed them, and the unit that borrowed them was military, and the call had come from the Pentagon. You had no problem with supplying the rifles. So years later, we we've replaced them. Well, then when I told him about that in the Pentagon, he said, you know, he never knew where those rifles went. And General Shoup said, you know, uh, uh, Lem, he said, when you asked me for 12,000 rifles, just I thought you wanted them. And of course, being a good Marine, I gave you 12,000 rifles. He said, you owe me 12,000. They were, they were sitting there kidding. But they never knew they went to Indonesia. You see, they never knew they were part of a covert operation going into Indonesia. Well, this is true of of a lot of things that go on. We kept the books in the Pentagon. We covered that. We got reimbursement for it. That part of it was all right. And that's what kept it from from uh, a problem. Because as long as General Lemnitz's forces got the 30,000 rifles back and Shoup got the 12,000 back for the total of 42,000, they didn't complain to anybody. They had their full strength of rifles. You see, that's the magic of reimbursement. Okay. Well, this kind of thing... Uh, on an established basis, the units are there. When I said there are 605 units, those are operating units. Now, the, some of them may only be telephone drops because that's their function. They don't need a whole lot of people. They're just handling supplies or something like that. But put this in present terms. When Colonel North believed that he had been ordered to take 2,008 tow missiles and deliver them to Iran, see, 
there has to be some way that the supply system can let those go. You can't just drive down there with a truck in San Antonio at the warehouse and say, I want 2008 missiles. You have to have authority. And, and 2008 tow missiles, I don't know what one of them costs, but it's an awful lot of money. And somebody had to prepare the paperwork for the authorization to let the supply officer release those. And I'm sure they went to a cover unit that North was using for that purpose. But it appears from what we've heard from this that unlike the way we used to run the cover operations, when these things got to Iran, these characters sold them for money. Right. In fact, they sold them for almost four times the listed value of these things. And this is the problem Congress has been having, is what happened to the money after they got that. And, and you, you can see the, how the system developed. You see, originally we developed it on this one-for-one -one reimbursement basis. Another thing is we never use this kind of supply to deliver grenades to the Contras and, and charge them uh, $9 a grenade or whatever, whatever it was. We just delivered the grenades. It was part of a government program. And the CIA would reimburse the Defense Department. Everything came out even. We didn't sell anything, you see. So <laughs> I know how it worked in the 50s and 60s, but I can't tell you how it's been working in the 80s. I'm just astounded by what developed. But just like the general not knowing this, we had so many units in so many places around the world. And for, for instance, we learned that a scientist, as I recall at Caltech, had learned how to listen to radio transmission that was so brief that a whole paragraph would be a blip, electronic blip, you know, milliseconds. And he learned to stretch that millisecond blip into readable language. He did it with, uh, I think, what uh, elect electronics experts would say, and I certainly am not one of them, is like this uh, characteristic of a cathode tube that when you turn the thing off for a little while, it still glows. Well, this was called, a, uh, well, I can't remember in a moment, but Rambo, the Rambo effect. And Dr. Rambo realized he could do that with radio waves just as well as the cathode tube could do it. And the Soviets were using this blip transition transmission on CW wave, constant wave, like Loran, to deliver uh, uh, secret messages. Well, the minute CIA heard about that, obviously they wanted the capability. So we used an Air Force unit to go to one of the major radio suppliers, electronic suppliers, for the Air Force, and by feeding CIA dollars into that ongoing contract and without raising any eyebrows at all, we had that company over a period of about a year and a half develop a super receiver capability that could listen to the CW tone, discover that millisecond blip on there, stretch the blip to readable language, and then get a translator to translate from Russian to American. Well, now, that's a, a, a tremendous achievement when you think about it, because it, it broke the whole system of that kind of cryptology, and it did it with dollars that never affected the Defense Department, but we used the defense structure to do it so that the company that did it had no idea that they were dealing with the CIA. They just thought it was a part of an ongoing Air Force contract. That's one of the way these things are done. <clears throat> There's a major company in this country in the Fortune 500 listing called EGNG. It's Edgerton, Germershausen, and Greer. <clears throat> and most of their work is in a very highly classified area of operations for the U.S. government. Well, I'm not sure to this day that EGNG realizes that in their earlier days when they were a somewhat smaller company, much of the funding that went into their company came through this channel from the CIA to the Air Force and to EGNG so the EGNG would de develop these very, very special things, really, for covert operations, not for, for Air Force or Army. But there's a lot of companies that have had those uh, contracts, and this is not a small operation. And the only thing that bothered me, and, and it bothers me today, was that there was no way to let the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff know this. Now, I think uh, my role, since I was... Uh, had just been assigned to the, to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. My work, uh, if you'll remember my earlier uh, uh, bio material, I was five years with the Air Force and then two years with the Office of Secretary of Defense. 
And then Mr. McNamara decided to transfer that to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Well, one of my functions there was to become a briefing officer for the chairman so he would know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I think we serve quite a purpose there because from that time on, every time we got into one of these things, I would brief him right away. And uh, that at least kept him alert to this. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I fail to see that function, we'll say, in this Iran-Contra era. I don't think anybody from NSC was going down to the chairman or the, the secretaries of the various departments of the military and saying, this is what we're doing, or this is just to keep them current. After all, they have the right to know all this. See? Right. It's, it's an important function. It's a much larger function, much more costly function than people realize that it is. And because of the odd way this country has decided to do covert operations, it's almost uncontrolled. Yeah. except for NSC. And if NSC does not do their job, then it is uncontrolled. And this is the big issue today, even after Ali North's trial. The NSC members are sitting back and saying, we didn't do any of it. It seems to me the jurors realize they did. They think Reagan was involved, Bush was involved, Weinberger was involved. They had to be involved, you know? But this is the breakdown right now, and we're going to have a hard time restructuring this business again because... All covert op op operations require foreign alliances. They're all bilateral. Yeah. You can't go, you can't take an aircraft and make a power drop in Tibet without letting the Indian government know that you are using their airways to fly to Tibet for an illegal or a covert drop. So we would notify the Indian government, you see, or we'd notify the Pakistani government or the government of Thailand and so on. In almost every covert, I, in fact, I can hardly think of a, any way to operate a covert operation without at least a bilateral agreement. Well, if we don't have our agreements in order, how on earth can we work with these other people around the world? And this is serious business. And this is why the other countries around the world have begun to lose faith in the things that we're doing because either we're not telling them or we're getting them involved in something that they don't want to be involved in. You know, they don't want to be even connected with it. <clears throat> One or two more follow-ups then. Uh, what was the sense among the three of you talking there about the implications that where the CIA was concerned, there were a lot of things no one seemed to know? As I recall that uh, meeting, uh, my office had just been moved from the office of the Secretary of Defense into the Joint Chiefs of Staff structure, which was a very formal structure. At that time, it was legally controlled at 400 officers. And even to move my small office down there, they had to increase the congressional approval of the uh, more than 400 limit on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So uh, it, was a, it was an important move when they made it. Now, although I may have joked a little bit about the generals not knowing uh, that, this, that such a, uh, an enormous organization existed around the world in our support of CIA, they were very serious about it. They, they felt that it was um, a, a real oversight to have this sort of thing going on without review. And I'm of the opinion that this is one of the real reasons why the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Mr. McNamara had agreed to establish this Office of Special Operations within the Joint Chiefs of Staff so that all the military forces would be treated equally in their supporting activities in the CIA and so that the chairman would always be briefed on what was going on in, uh, in covert work and in the support of covert work, which goes on every day. The covert operation might be 10 days, but we support them year-round. Uh, it was a serious business, and they recognized it as such. You write further on that by the time of the Bay of Pigs operation, the CIA was part of a greater team which used the agency and other parts of the government to carry out almost any secret operation it wanted. By that time, this organization had the equipment, the facilities, the men, and the funds to carry out clandestine operations that were so vast that even on the basis of simple definition, they were no longer truly secret nor could anyone hope that they might be. The availability of supplies and facilities made it possible for all of this to come about. The growth of the CIA and of the greater secret team 
has resulted more from the huge success of the deputy director of support side of the agency than from either the deputy director of plans or the deputy director of intelligence. Uh, please comment on the importance you ascribe to this deputy director of support side of the agency. Well, it's, it's one thing to, uh, to have an approval to carry out a covert operation and then to be able to go to the Defense Department or any other part of the government and get support for that operation. It's a completely other thing to have warehouses full of equipment, ships, aircraft, and people all over the world, and be able to, to, uh, to carry on covert operation in a regular basis. And by, uh, you, you've used a good point of reference to the Bay of Pigs. By 1960, when uh, President Eisenhower approved the early actions that later led to the Bay of Pigs, and these were very, very small matters, the agency was able itself to schedule a program that they knew was going to be a major program. Uh, any of us in covert operation knows that 3,000 men in a program that led to putting, what was it, 1,200, 1,300 on a beach in a foreign country is not covert. You can't train 3,000 men in Guatemala, Nicaragua, uh, some unfortunately in Mexico by inadvertence, and uh, operate radio stations off islands in the Caribbean, et cetera, et cetera, and call it covert. It's just a joke. The New York Times was reporting on the program almost daily. Castro was broadcasting about its threat almost daily, and yet it was called a covert program. The, the, the thing that, that was against being covert was its size. But, be that as may, the CIA had the aircraft. They had the B-26s. In fact, we, as I think I said sometime earlier, we had created for the Cuban exiles an air force, a tactical combat air force that was larger than any air force in Latin America at the time. And that came from CIA assets. That was their aircraft. There were planes that were used in uh, the Indonesia business. They took planes back from the Vietnam theater. They used uh, a lot of um, C-54s that Air America had put together. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting what they did do. They even brought... Philippine Army officers who had worked with General Lansdale in the Magsaysay campaign in the Philippines back in the 50s, they even brought some of those officers into Guatemala to do the training there. You see, they had the facilities that were worldwide and involving people even from other governments. It was, so this is what they had gotten into existence in time to run something like this anti-Castro program. Yet, when it started, the first request the agency made to the Department of Defense when they got the approval from Eisenhower to start this uh, anti-Castro move was for two Navy doctors. That's all they needed. They said, we need two Navy doctors. The Navy did not want to give up two doctors at that time. They didn't have two that they could do it because it was a long-term, indeterminate period. So the CIA men came to my office and they said, could we get uh, two Air Force doctors. Most of our doctors were flight surgeons. We did not want to give them up. But I talked to our the chief surgeon in the Air Force, and he had a few doctors at that time, I think at Lackland Air Base in Texas, that would be willing to do this on a voluntary basis and, and uh, that he could spare. So it happened that we sent two Air Force doctors to begin the program. That is all it was. They didn't ask for anything else. Here's the anti-Castro program beginning, and they wanted two doctors. Of course, we asked them why. The reason was that they were going to put hundreds of Cuban exile men who were enrolled in the army uh, at a small uh, military base that belonged to the U.S., was used by the U.S. in Panama. And uh, they needed doctors because the men would be in the, in the base in Panama. They didn't ask us for equipment. They didn't ask for airplanes and rifles and all, trucks and everything. They had that. that see, so they could, just by filling in with a few things they didn't have, they were ready to go. And they were ready to go more than we thought. They, were, they had a lot of capability. Uh, within uh, a month or so, they were building a big air base uh, over near Rotalaleo in uh, Guatemala. And uh, they did this themselves, bulldozers and every other darn thing. And, of course, with their money, they bought for the construction. So by the time of the 1960s, the agency could run major operations, major warfare, you might call it, by themselves. 
Well, <clears throat> this led to an interesting bit of political development because during the summer of 60, we were using primarily a World War II aircraft, transport aircraft called a C-46, carry 40 or 50 people or carry a pretty good sized cargo. We'd fly it from Guatemala or Nicaragua to uh, Cuba. We would not fly it from the United States. We don't want any reference to the United States. They still thought they were playing a covert game. <laughs> and we'd make airdrops in Cuba. <clears throat> well, this was a kind of a touch and go game and many of the airdrops just disappeared. They didn't drop to the right people or Castro found out about it and uh, intercepted it for them. But in any case, that's what they were doing, small airdrops and uh, mostly of equipment, weapons, communications gear to what they thought were people on the ground who would handle it uh, in the anti-Castro movement. Well, that went on until uh, the political campaign of 1960, and it was pretty active. And the most active person on this from the administration side was Richard Nixon, and he was running for president and uh, against Kennedy. In the uh, very close election, when uh, Kennedy won, within a week, the agency came in and told us that they were planning for uh, a force of 3,000 Cuban exiles and that their target would be an invasion of Cuba. <clears throat> well, this was something they developed themselves. I know very well from the repeated dealings we had with the White House from March of 60 until November of 60, that President Eisenhower never, never authorized an invasion of Cuba. But the agency, able to plan for that themselves, and realizing Eisenhower was in a lame duck position after the election, and that Kennedy, although he knew about this training program, had no idea what the limitations put on it were, would probably accept this kind of thing. They just moved it from small airdrop things, or over the beach. We put a lot of teams over the beach from uh, pontoon raft equipment and that kind of thing. And the next thing you know, we were in this big program. So that when Alan Dulles and uh, Richard Bissell briefed Kennedy, I think in uh, the end of November or December of 60, uh, down at Kennedy's home in Palm Beach, they were talking of a 3,000-man force, not these little intermittent airdrops. I think there's two things here, though, that the agency wasn't aware of. Kennedy knew the Cuban, Cuban leaders. <clears throat> One of Kennedy's close friends was Senator Smathers of Florida. Senator Smather had connections with all the Cuban people in Florida, and I think he had briefed Kennedy. Because in an interesting little uh, event, I was asked one day to go from the Pentagon to the Senate office building to Senator Kennedy's office and to take a car that could carry six people, the driver, myself, and four passengers. <clears throat> so I went over to the Senate office building, went into Kennedy's office, and I sat there for a few minutes, and the senator came out and shaking hands goodbye to four men who were Cubans. Uh, I could tell by their Spanish accent, tell by the names that Kennedy called them, and they seemed like old friends. Kennedy was patting one of them on the back and, well, I'll see what we can do for you and all that sort of thing. And then the senator turned to me and he said, the Secretary of Defense wants to meet these people. You please take them back to the Pentagon to see the Secretary of Defense. Well, those four men, one of them was Manuel Artima, Artima was the commanding officer on the beach of the brigade in Cuba. Kennedy knew Artima, and he had talked with Artima. He knew what Artima's plans were. The other man, Mendonca, was one of a former, I believe, former president of Cuba for a short time. There was a man named Deverona, who was one of the leaders of the Cuban exile group, and I can't recall the fourth man, but that's the type of people they were. They were the top people that Alan Dulles had put together for the Cuban exile group, and here was Kennedy meeting them privately in his own office. He knew them ahead of time. So the people that think Kennedy didn't know what was going on don't understand how much experience Kennedy had with this kind of thing. When do you think that meeting really was? This took place in August of 1960, just about the same time that Kennedy had announced he was going to run for president. He'd already gotten so, the nomination. By, you mean pardon? in August of 60, they'd already had the Democratic Convention that summer. Well, I'm talking about the same period. These were almost the okay. period was almost identical. And uh, 
In fact, I can tell you how we can pin the date down. There's no question about it. Our team <clears throat> had just come from addressing the annual American Legion Convention in Detroit that year, okay. which I believe was in August of, uh, okay. of 1960. So th these things were happening one right on top of the other, you see. But the most important thing was that later on people were saying, well, uh, Nixon knew all about this uh, uh, brigade going into Cuba, but, but Kennedy didn't know about it. Uh, Kennedy did. Yeah. He was smart. He kept it quiet. Well, uh, as this force developed by January of 1961, just before the inaugural, the agency was making uh, regular plans for an invasion on the beach. And they brought in a Marine colonel named Jack Hawkins to uh, head the tactical situation, to make the plans for it. And it was a very good plan. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier they, <coughs> they, um, they decided that that the absolute fundament of the plan was to uh, wipe out all Castro's combat aircraft, which meant the, a the CIA was going to use their own aircraft, which had the combat capability. These were these B-26s that had been developed for the Indonesian campaign, and use them in air battles, go right over Cuba, and destroy Castro's air force before they ever invaded the beach. This was a key to that program. Well, I'll go that far with this story, because I don't think we're supposed to be talking about the Bay of Pigs. But, you see, they could do these things themselves. They, they, even the beginning of combat in Laos and combat in Vietnam were done with equipment that the agency owned by the period of 1960-61. It was a major combat force by that time. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, uh, from your own experiences, that Alan Dulles knew back in the late 40s, uh, or at least by the time he wrote the Jack Dulles Jackson Career Report, <coughs> How important this component of the CIA would be? You mean to develop the uh, its own Logistics. its own? Well, of course, the thing that Mr. Dulles realized, uh, and we must not downplay the ability of Jackson, who was uh, actually was deputy director of uh, the CIA for years too, a very knowledgeable man, and and Matthias Correa. They realized that. Covert operations require materiel, right. and they also realize that if you don't have your own, you can't make your plans yourself. Having to uh, make plans with borrowed equipment is always rather difficult. So you can see that in this really the reason I go back to this Jackson Korea Dulles documents so often, and I think why I why I called it the Dulles Mein Kampf was. This was the plan of the future of CIA. There's no yeah. question about that. Yeah. And it was based upon having the ability to do it. The bases, the people, the airplanes, the ships, everything else. Writing about <coughs> some of the attempts of some senators to try to, or Congress people to try to have a little more oversight of this run, potentially runaway capabilities, you write, it was in 1955 that the then new Senator Mansfield, among others, attempted to get a law through the Congress that would establish a strong watchdog committee to oversee the CIA. One of the principal reasons for this law, one of the principal reasons this law did not pass was that such CIA stalwarts as Senator Russell and Senator Saltonstall affirmed that there were, was no need for such committees. I have worked closely with Senator Saltonstall and many others who are on those committees, and except in rare instances, they never knew that the CIA was so huge. They knew how big the CIA was within the bounds of the real or intelligence organization, but none of them knew about its tremendous global base capability. And what is much more important, none of them knew the intricacies of the agency's supporting system that existed in the name of the Army Special Forces and the Air Force Air Supply and Communications Wings. No one man or no one group of knowledgeable men have ever had the opportunity to see the whole picture. As I have heard Senator Saltonstall, Saltonstall say, now don't tell me about that classified material. What I don't know won't hurt me. That has been a general attitude on Capitol Hill <coughs> in discussions I have had with responsible committee men on the Hill, I have found this to exist as recently as September 1971. This situation has not changed much. There are no congressmen and no senators who really know what the agency, who know about the agency and about what the agency is doing. 
And I'd like you to discuss this crippling impact on the very essence of our constitutional form of government that is every day becoming more and more endemic because of elected officials betraying the responsibilities of their office when they indicate no desire whatsoever to be accurately appraised of classified material and its fundamental implications. Well, of course, that varies with individuals and it varies with time, but it's a pretty accurate statement, uh, unfortunately so. You see, in the eyes of Congress, when they created CIA, they were creating a coordinating organization. That doesn't give them too much power. So the congressman can sit back and say, look, we wrote the law. Here's what the law says, and this is what we expect them to do. Except for one thing, the amount of money that they've been appropriating to this ever-expanding organization. So I can't excuse them for not realizing that, that there's a requirement for oversight. Where's the money going? But then again, they sort of back out of that because only a few congressmen know how much money is appropriated. It's a very narrow area. But that doesn't mean they don't know, and it, again, is their responsibility. So they lean on the fact that, look, to control the CIA, we created an organization called the NSC, the President, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of Defense. If they can't control that organization, you know, those are our top people, then what are you talking to us about? See, it isn't Congress's job. And from that point of view, they're accurate. It is not up to the congressman to control the covert operations. It's up to the administration because they're the ones that direct it, at least by law. So you can make a case for both sides. During my work with this activity, I was told frequently and regularly by senior officers in the Pentagon generals and secretaries of departments and so on, to go over to the Congress and speak to the cleared congressman about what we were doing on a certain covert operation. Uh, I, remember and, and it <clears throat> I remember in my first clearance, it was explained to me that Senator Russell and Senator Saltonstall were the cleared officers, cleared senators. I went over to see them. Well, it just happened that Senator Saltonstall knew my father. My father knew Saltonstall pretty well. So when he heard my name right away, how's your father, how's this? No, we got along just great. And then I said, now look, General Martin has sent me over here to talk to you about a covert operation, which the eyes run. Now look, if General Martin knows about that operation, and if the Defense Department is taking care of it, I don't need to know about that, Colonel, what I don't know. And really, this was the way it was handled. Um, I wouldn't say that he meant it exactly that way, but it's what you get because I know I wasn't able to tell him about it. He yeah. didn't want to hear it. The very fact that I came to tell him, I think, was simply enough to confirm that we were in some operation that he'd probably hear about later, especially if something went wrong, and uh, that would do, that would suffice. But he wasn't going to sit there and be the conduit for everything we knew in the Defense Department between himself and then all of us the members of Congress. Right. He may have felt that if he told them about one operation, then they'd expect him to tell them about every, all of them, and that'd be bedlam for him, too. But that's trying to make a case for him. Well, what I can report to you is that in my many, many visits, both to Saltonstall and uh, Russell, and then a lot of others, that's just two I recall, the general feeling was that if the operation had been directed by the President, by the NSC, and if the Defense Department was supporting the CIA, then it must be all right, must yeah. be official. You can't read it any other way. I mean, they weren't joking about this. It's just they were saying, we've set the system up, it should work. But as you can see, it proliferated into things that they didn't know about. And now, again, with the Iran-Contra thing, you have Congress saying, look, we didn't know anything about that at all. And we have NSC saying we don't know anything about it at all. See, so it does get worse and worse when you try to run things that way. But that was my own experience with it. I could not brief senators. They would not listen to it. Because they felt it was in the proper hands that it should be? Well, in. they thought, you know, the very fact that I was there proved to them that it must be in proper mm -hmm. hands. You, you see, you can see exactly. the man's point of view. Sure. Because if I'm there to tell him, he's saying, okay, it must be a legitimate organization. Mm -hmm. If it was a real sneaky one, I wouldn't have been there, see? <laughs> so that's his rationale. Okay. Uh, you quote extensively from... Uh, Lyman Kirkpatrick's book, The Real CIA, uh, who you describe as a very exemplary officer and uh, capable man, quoting uh, in The Secret Team, f quoting from the book, The Real CIA, among the inner group of top agency careerists, this is talking about Kirkpatrick, 
He was a moderate and a most dedicated man. As a result of his statement, the excerpts from his book, The Real CIA, as a result, his statement takes on a very special meaning. It is an example of the blind statement of faith found in a religious order. The great error and the great damage, however, from this kind of thinking arises in the fact that it is predicated on the belief that the leaders of the agency can do no wrong when the same organization is given the authority to develop and control all foreign secret intelligence and to take its findings <coughs> based upon the inputs of this secret intelligence directly to the last authority, the president, not only to take it to him <coughs> regularly, but to preempt his time, attention, and energies almost to the point of making him their captive and then also is given the authority and the vast means to carry out peacetime clandestine operations, that agency has been given the power to control the foreign operations of the government on a continuing day-to-day -day basis. Please comment on the effect or effects. This sense of infallibility that the leaders of the agency felt imbued with had on the decisions and choices they made and on the goals they defined. Uh, the first part of your question ought to be dealt with a little bit. Uh, Lyman Kirkpatrick, uh, Ray Klein, uh, Pierre De Silva are three men who have uh, extensive agency experience who have written books. Uh, fortunately, their books are better than most books that are written by outsiders. They don't try to hide things or change things or conceal things from the public. They are telling. Now, they don't write about certain things. They just don't put them in a book. But they are the, probably as reliable. I have a very large library of agency books, most of which are trash. But those three from careerists are quite responsible. And if I had to pick one, I would pick Lyman Kirkpatrick's as a pretty good Now, remember, of course, it was written, what, 25 years ago. But it's still a good book. Lyman Kirkpatrick served in, in uh, many capacities in the agency, and if it had not been for the unfortunate fact that he had a very serious case of, uh, of paralysis and had to travel around in a wheelchair, I'm sure he would have followed Alan Dulles as the director of Central Intelligence instead of Dick Helms, because uh, not that Dick Helms would qualify, but Kirkpatrick would have followed Dulles. And um, uh, that was unfortunate. So that what he says about the agency is generally accurate, and uh, he, he, was, he was really, among his friends and acquaintances in the agency, uh, a competent person and a reliable person. And I found him to be that way. Now, as we go along with the rest of this, uh, read your question, because I reserve sure. this idea about the writers. Because, you see, the trouble with the agency, uh, a, a problem the agency has is that a lot of people write about it who really have never served a day with it, or if they have, they have some axe to grind, one or the other. You know, um, uh, another writer, it's hard to remember, who, who's, who's the man that worked right in the agency's headquarters and, uh, and wrote with uh, Marx and, uh, John Marx. you know, um, his own book? Oh, yeah, a really good book about the agency, yeah. Not... Um John Stockwell, or uh, Ralph no. McGeehy, or... No, er earlier than that. Uh, oh. Well, anyhow, uh, it's, it's hard to get a good book about the agency unless you've been an ins insider, no question about it. The, people, the other people that write have got some little angle or an axe to grind, and their books are not good. They're not accurate. So I, I wish to make that statement pretty clear okay. while we have it on the record. Now, repeat the last question, and I'll circle back to the rest of you. I, I'd like you to comment on the effect or effects. This sense of infallibility that the leaders of the agency felt imbued with had on the decisions and choices they made and on the goals they defined. Yeah. Uh, you see, to really understand CIA, you have to remember that Perhaps its best cover story is that it's an intelligence organization. See, um, it doesn't do much intelligence. Uh, intelligence is gathered by other, uh, other assets throughout the government, among which today the agency has quite a bit, but that wasn't why they were created. In covert operations, which is their big money deal, you then divide up into like the mechanical and electronic things like uh, U-2s and SR-71s and the satellites and all that, photographs and that whole business. 
Okay, that's the technical side of the agency. Then you get into this other part of covert operations where you're dealing with people and spies and agents and that sort of thing. Now, that's a business that almost, 